It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is The Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Daniel Wilcox. Hello and welcome to the Great Writer Share podcast with me, Daniel Wilcox, where every week I hijack an hour or so of time from some of the kindest and hardest working writers around today to join me on the show and discuss everything that makes them tick, raw and bounce. Today's date is the 24th of March and I'm going to start in a place that everyone is probably already sick of um, because I think it's completely unrealistic to negate the fact that coronavirus has gripped the world. Um, I didn't speak much to this last week because by this time last week, there wasn't a great deal of news in the UK, but a lot has changed. Uh, I'm sure everyone's feeling it if you're over in America. Hi, stay strong, keep in there. Um, and anyone else who's listening uh, across the globe as well, this is an interesting time to be alive, to experience. I'm um, pretty much speaking to most people that I know, I've not seen anything like this before. And uh, I thought I'd start just by doing my little nod to coronavirus, health and safety tips and stuff. Um, mostly because I don't want to bog down my episodes in this kind of stuff every week. But with this being a podcast for writers to help people through mindset and everything else, obviously coronavirus is going to have a massive impact on people's mental health, on their mindset, on their well-being. Um, so uh, I just thought I'd say a couple of notes on that before I dive into the usual stuff. One thing that I'll say before I get into that, though, is you probably will hear <laughs> my, my neighbor's kids jumping around on the bouncy castle next door um i'm recording this in the daytime because i'm recording it when i normally do because i like to keep routine and habit um but usually the neighbor's kids are at school and obviously that's not going to be the case today so hopefully it's not going to be too much of a disturbance for the intro it won't affect the interview that you'll listen to later um but just an fyi if you hear kids screaming that's why they're fine they're bouncing um and that's my email, so I'm going to turn that off too. Uh, um, so yeah, coronavirus, staying positive. I mean, a lot of people who are listening to this are probably already used in some capacity to working at home. Um, my top tips, and I'll keep these fairly brief, um, are keep routine, because routine will be massively important to ensuring that your body knows what to expect, that your mind knows what to expect, and uh, that you can actually get the work done that you need to. Um I'm speaking specifically to full-time writers, although for uh, part-time writers or newbie writers, welcome to the show, number one. Um, but also establishing that routine is going to be absolutely fundamental in getting through the next few weeks. I think there's a massive temptation for a lot of people to stay in bed for longer, to work in their pyjamas and all that that good stuff that you'd get on the weekend when you want to settle down, relax, and sort of kick off your shoes at the end of a long, hard week. Um, every day is going to blur into the same Weekends are probably going to feel much like work days, or they, they will, in my opinion. They already do <laughs> most of the time for me. Um, but yeah, absolutely try and keep that routine. Get get yourself up, get yourself dressed. Live your, live your normal day as if nothing's changed. You're just working at home instead. Um, and that will carry you quite a long distance. Um, don't put too much pressure on yourself. These are unprecedented times, and I think there's a, there'll be an expectation for people to think they can still do the things that they were doing. So for those of you who... Um, I, I don't know, for example, if you're getting 4,000 words a day on a normal day, it's likely that for the next few days, possibly the next few weeks, that's going to be a bit trickier to, to hit. Don't don't stress too much about it. Um, your, your body is adapting. Your mind is adapting. There's a lot of uh, adjustments that need to be made in order just to digest all the slew of information coming through the media, through the news, through the radio, through the internet, everything. Um your, your mind will be overwhelmed with content and uh, will we'll actually, that'll, that will be my next point, which will be try to regulate how much media you're consuming or how much news you're consuming and be mindful of the sources through which you are receiving that information. So my number one go-to is I do not use social media for news. That is just not my go-to. Um, I've already been tagged in posts by family members and friends about certain different origins of the coronavirus, all the stuff the government isn't telling you, things that you should and shouldn't be doing which are incorrect, uh, a load of scientific uh, articles that don't actually have any source cited. Um, don't don't fall prey to a lot of that stuff. I know that 
last week, particularly when it was in the height of the stuff in the UK here, and they were announcing all the different measures to self-isolate, to social distance, and uh, as of yesterday, to officially lock down. Um, I, I had a day in which I found the work very, very hard to complete because I was so bogged down in information, and I deliberately the next day just stayed away from any news whatsoever um, because ultimately the world's going to keep turning. Your world might shrink a little bit with you having to stay inside most of the time, but the world's going to keep turning. You can digest news whenever you want to, but if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed, if you're feeling like your head's sort of a thousand different places at the minute, then my suggestion is to shut off social media, shut off the news, live a day, just go out. It's in the UK, especially at the minute, for some reason, I don't know what this is, but the, the last three days have been absolutely beautiful. And uh, I've, I've got out in the sun a few times um, just to get the vitamin D, to get the exercise. Um, I've got to ration it now because it's one exercise a day, according to Boris Johnson. Um, <laughs> so that's going to be probably a three hour walk for me. Um, but yeah, definitely get out there. Just just live in the real world for a little bit. Turn off your notification on your phone, everything else, unless obviously you've got people that you need to care for or whatnot. But you can find ways to shut off everything else and just to focus on what's important to you. Um, because... The whole point of the media is to sensationalize, is to grab your attention, is to find grabbing headlines that are going to stir up a ruckus. And you don't have to consume that stuff. Um, or if you do, just be mindful that each media outlet is trying to find its angle to keep people reading. And probably for them, they've never had greater numbers in readership by now. So just be wary of that. That's very important. Uh, and just one final note on that, coming back to the sources cited, no matter what you're reading online, if it's stating a medical, a scientific fact of any kind, please do your research before sharing it. Um, I this is a this is a trivial example, but I once had a friend a few years ago circulating an article that uh, who was it? It was um, oh my mind's gone blank. It was basically a female uh, hip hop star. It's going to come back to me in a minute. I'm going to shout it just randomly in a sentence. A female hip hop star, um, Iggy Azalea. Boom, there we go. Had died in some horrific accident. And when you actually go into the article, there's no evidence whatsoever that's going. She's still alive and well today. Um, but people are just blindly sharing stuff because they feel like they're doing their duty in spreading information. And a lot of the times that misinformation is just not helpful for people. So please just be considerate before you share those and scare your mum, your dad, your family, whatever. Uh, I know one of the big ones going around at the minute, and I've not looked enough into this to know if this is uh, false or true um so i'm not going to say definitively but i've got a hunch of which way this is going to go is that this virus is a pathogen that was released from a laboratory or a laboratory however you say it um and is a man-made thing and i don't know that's not where my information is telling me this all has come from but it's that kind of stuff where if it's shared it scares a lot of people my nan was in tears yada 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 so please be considerate who you're sharing it with um and just be mindful and give yourself some space breathe meditate if you need to an hour without media is is not going to hurt you. Um, and the last two things I'll say on that, because I'm aware I'm on a bit of a soapbox right now, but I feel like I this is this is stuff that particularly I've been paying a lot of attention to for years. This is partly the reason for the show is to spread positivity and mindset and to give you guys hints and ways to adapt and cope, particularly with uh, writing, because writing is a solitary venture, yada, yada, yada. Um, but also it works a lot of these times. Um, the last two, number one, uh, on that list is stay positive we're already in a bit of a shit situation um the world is suffering the world is changing there is going to be a, a time in your life when you look at life from pre-virus post-virus that's that's inevitable that's going to happen the one thing that you can control and you can keep on top of is your mindset your positivity your happiness if you are in a house and you're surrounded by people you love that's fucking awesome um if you are I don't know, if, if you find your mind sinking into negativity and worry and panic, then just try and swing it around. I mean, things could be a thousand times worse. We, we, we have relatives, a lot of us have relatives or people that they know that fought in times where the end was uncertain, where bombs were flying through the sky, everything else. This is, this is just a blip on the radar. We're lucky. We've got Netflix, Disney Plus launches today. We've got Kindles. We've got everything we need to keep ourselves entertained. So we're, we're in a good position. The supermarkets are fine. Delivery stocks are coming through. You don't need to panic buy, all that kind of stuff. Um, so just just try and keep positive. It's weird. It is weird. But, uh, you know, we all, we all thrive under a challenge and we'll get through this and everything will be fine. Um, so just keep powering through. And my last bit of advice, uh, something that I've done a couple of times this week with different people is if you are bored, if you are lonely, um, I know that for myself, I am officially under self-isolation for 14 days by NHS advice because my son had a cough. Um, which I'm 90% sure is not coronavirus, but 
I'm now doing my bit and fully locking down and barely even going out for the other stuff, um, is virtual pubs. We are lucky enough that the internet is fantastic. We are lucky enough that we have video conferencing. A few times this week, I've jumped onto a virtual pub um, using a facility such as, I don't know, Skype or Facebook Messenger Hangout or Zoom. Um, speak to people. Get people you've not spoken to in ages on on a chat and then just have a bit of a virtual pub with them. Have a bit of a catch up. How are they doing? It's been a while. You can have up to eight people on Facebook Messenger in a video chat. On Zoom, you can have up to 50 people uh, with only, let me get this right, you can have 50 people present able to comment uh, in, a, in a text box with six or eight people live and able to chat. Um, for a minimum, for a maximum of 40 minutes. And then Skype has a lot of stuff as well that might be quite useful. So check those out. Um, see people's faces. You're going to need it, particularly, uh, like you say, if, if you're in my situation where I'm basically going to be by myself for a little while, then just try and do what you can to reach out and not make yourself feel so lonely. It'll be over soon. And we will all go back to living a somewhat <laughs> normal existence. Okay, I'm going to step off my soapbox now and make a really crappy sound effect as if I'm stepping off my soapbox. There we go. Hardwood floors for the win. Today's guest. <laughs> Today's guest is the uh, wonderful Jeffrey A. Carver, who is a sci-fi writer. He is a... Um, uh, let me find my notes. That's helpful. He, is, he was a finalist for the 2001 Nebula Awards. Uh, a very interesting guy who I came across who... Uh, the, the interesting part about a lot of this subject is that Jeffrey has been publishing for a number of years, um, but he took an 11-year break in 2009... 2008, 2009, in which life happened. We go into that in the interview. But he didn't find himself actually publishing again uh, any new work until 2019. So we go quite in depth about the differences in publishing changes from sort of traditional to indie. We talk a bit about hybridity. Um, and we talk a lot about the how Jeffrey is adapting to the different changes, the different challenges, how he's going about publishing his own work, audiobook adap adaptation, everything else under his own imprint. Um so that's quite an interesting part we go into. We also go a lot into his process uh, and how he has learned over the years to trust his own process, even if he doesn't understand it, but also trying to find a way to understand his process. And we talk a lot about his teaching. Um, Jeffrey used to run a TV show, Educating Children, and he's also got courses on how to teach, on how to uh, write sci-fi. Um, so we go a lot into sort of the altruism behind teaching and how that can benefit your own fiction. No new patrons today, but for anyone who wants to support the show for as little as $1 a month, you can jump over to patreon.com forward slash great writers share, where for as little as the $1 aforementioned, <laughs> you can get early access to episodes, you can get ad free episodes, you can get entered into the monthly giveaway, you can ask guests questions and loads more good stuff. Um, terrible English, but I will continue. Uh, I will be announcing the winner of March's uh, giveaway next week, which is Rebecca Symes' book, uh, Dear Writer, You Need to Quit. Fantastic read. I've already read about it enough. Um, but that will be announced next week. So keep a listen out for that. I'll announce that on the Patreon group and in the Facebook group. Um, and one extra note for anyone who was thinking about getting any kind of merchandise, Redbubble, who is my provider for merchandise, are offering 20% off of absolutely everything on their store for the next few months uh, while all the coronavirus stuff is going ahead. So... If you want an additional 20% off of any of the products that you might have been uh, thinking of getting before, then go ahead and grab one of those now before it's too late. Last week's question. How do you tackle negativity and self-doubt with your writing? Um, this was uh, extremely prevalent considering the talk that I had with Jonathan Jans last week, and I got a slew of answers. So I'll try and get through these as best I can. I'm aware that I've been talking for quite a while, so I might be a little bit breathless. But bear with me. I will get through these for you, people. <laughs> uh, Kev Harrison says, For me, it depends how hard the self-doubt bites. If it's a mild bout, I'll try to get my head down and plow on. If it's a fiercer episode, I'll often step away for a day or two, watch some movies, read, do some exercise, and take the pressure off. Not for too long, obviously. Uh, definitely a great tip. It's always uh, amazing how beneficial it can be for myself just to step back for 24 hours, 48 hours, and just let your brain work on stuff in the background while you just work on other things in the foreground and just have a bit of fun. Um, definitely keep filling up that creative tank. Dawn Chapman says, dealing with the, you've been around this community forever, why aren't you doing better, was one of the main things that was shot my way by one of the other top tier authors. Did it make me question my writing? Sure. Did it make me feel any different about how I'd done and published a story? No. It, was, it wasn't something I would change at all, despite it not doing as well as some others. No matter the negative reviews, no matter the negative reviews or messages, look to those and look inside for that burning story that won't let you go. That's what drives me. Those characters need letting out into the world. 
definitely know your why, plow on. Um, you don't judge yourself by other people's standards. It's ridiculous. Meg Cowley, when it's bad, and by it, I mean self-doubt or depression, I focus on what I can do, not what I can't. I take one day, sometimes even one hour at a time. If I don't manage to get something done, I'm working really hard on forgiving myself, not beating myself up, and praising myself for what I have got done, even a small step forward is going in the right direction. Uh, as she also adds, I printed out some amazing reviews from readers that I framed and put on my put by my writing chair to remind me that I can do this. Definitely a fantastic piece of advice there, something I'm going to steal for myself. Jason Nugent. I face this all the time. I doubt my words make sense to others. I doubt my stories are good enough. I doubt my ability. I doubt I have any clue about what I'm doing. But then I take a break. I read something else or do nothing for a while to clear my head and then go right back to it. I want to earn enough from my writing to support my family. But until that time, I have to trust the majority of the readers who believe in my stories. They keep me going with their kind words and support. 100% definitely uh, find a lot of the time that the readers are what underpins everything that we do keeps us going if you don't have readers yet they will come because it's impossible for everyone in the world not to like what you're doing so just keep on pushing um final comment from hb line one of my previous guests from a few weeks ago i suffer quite badly from from comparisonitis so i have to be mindful who i look at and what i take from from it as that's my main source of self-doubt and negativity I've been very fortunate to attract readers who love my books and not really receive much negative feedback. So I am a writer who reads my reviews and emails from others. That always bolsters me when I question whether I can keep going or not. Um, comparisonitis is huge and definitely one of the huge um, or the biggest contributions to self-doubt and negativity. Uh, definitely be mindful of who you are judging yourself against. Everyone's on a different step of their journey. You don't know everyone's behind the scenes, what they're, what they're doing in the background. And you've just got to stick to your guns and do what you think is best for your author business. So... Thank you, everyone, for submitting those uh, answers to the question. Next week's question, not so much based off the interview this week, but definitely uh, based on the current circumstances and something that I'm hoping will instill some positivity and help people in these trying times, is how have you found positivity in the unlikely places while adhering to the quarantines? There's a question I never thought I'd ask. Um, if you want to answer that, then hop on over to my Patreon, hop on over to the Facebook group, or tag me at Wilcox Author on any social media networks, or use the hashtag the Great Writers Share. Now, I've spoken enough. Without any further ado, let's go to the reason that you're here, which is to dive into the interview with the one and the only Jeffrey A. Carver. Enjoy. Jeffrey A. Carver is an American science fiction author. He was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and graduated from Brown University. He now lives outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and his novel Eternity's End was a finalist for the 2001 Nebula Awards. Welcome to the show, Jeffrey. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. No, I'm excited to have you. I've been, uh, I've been listening to some of your other interviews and uh, doing, obviously, my bits of research in the background to find out more about you. Um, and one of the things that struck out uh, the most to me, and one of the places I want to start, if you'll allow me, um, is, am I right in thinking that you recently released books five and six within the Chaos Chronicles series? And before that, it was actually 11 years since your last release. That is absolutely correct. Exciting. Yeah. Okay, so talk to me a little bit about so, uh, the latest releases and where that gap came from. Okay. Um, so this is following the previously, the last book had been Sunborn, number four. And... Um, well, as for where the gap came from, that's a long story, but it has more to do with life than with uh, books. Uh, although this was a very difficult uh, story to tell, and it turned out to be really long. Now, it's released as volumes five and six. It's really a single novel told in two volumes. Uh, it was written as The Reefs of Time, um, volume five, and it was freaking humongous when it was done, <laughs> even after a lot of cutting. And I finally uh, realized that I should just break it into two volumes and publish it that way. And they came out in quick succession. So this wasn't a case of leaving the audience hanging in the middle of the story for a year or two years until the next book came out. They had to wait uh, two months, I think. And, um, but it is, it's important to know that it is a single story, The Reefs of Time and Crucible of Time. Nice. And I, I grouped them loosely as the out-of-time sequence just in an attempt to avoid confusion because all of the other Chaos Chronicles books had been self-contained individual stories within a story arc, and this was different, so I tried to set it off that way. I may have created more confusion than I uh, alleviated, <laughs> I'm not sure. Is that what the reviews are showing, or is that just what you're worried about? Oh, no. Well, actually, <laughs> a couple of the reviewers have reviewed just one of the books, um, 
some reviewed the first book, some reviewed the second book, and they've been very favorable, but I've left scratching my head. Wait, didn't you notice that it was only half the story? Um, <laughs> that, that, you know, whatever works. Mm. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in that. And we will go in sort of all different directions, but I'm, I'm very interested in sort of the 11 year gap you did have, because um, one of the things that a lot of the people who come onto the show talk about is obviously how much publishing has changed within the last five or six years, let alone sort of 10 or 11 years. How, how has oh. it been from writing the first four in that series and obviously your other works to then stepping back in and coming back into it now? Uh, it was like stepping into a cyclone. Actually. Really? Um, publishing. Uh, well, during that period of time, um, when I was working on the book the entire 11 years, it, it's not as if I took 10 years off and then sat down and wrote the book. Um, during that time, I was busily bringing my backlist uh, back into print in ebook format under my own imprint, and then uh, later with a cooperative group. Um, so I had become familiar with the new shape of publishing from the point of view of bringing older books back into print. I'd never done an original book uh, in an indie fashion in that way before. And the Chaos series had been published by Tor Books, and these books were actually contracted with Tor Books, but they were horribly overdue. And uh, we all knew that. We acknowledged that. And I, right around the time I finished the books, they had actually gone through an editing process with a, a Tor consulting editor. Um, there were changes at Tor, and I was assigned another editor. And two weeks later, I got a call saying they've decided not to publish the new books because the older books were all out of print and already been reverted to me and blah, blah, blah. Um, so this was a, a shock to say the mm. least, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a killing shock because I was already geared up to do books. Um, I wasn't geared up for releasing a new title and, and promoting and marketing it. So that was, that was <laughs> new to me. Um, and I already had the first four books in ebook I didn't have them in new versions in print. So I said about last, this all happened uh, about a year ago. And I set a, a uh, proposed publication date in the end of July of last year. And I was hoping to release them with uh, as much pro uh, promotion as I could muster at Science Fiction World Con in Ireland last summer. Um, that I was unable to do because of a death in the family and I couldn't go to Ireland, but I still had everything scheduled. So I uh, was both doing the final creation of the, the print version, the ebook version, um, and trying to get the first four books back into new print editions all at the same time. And I seriously underestimated how labor intensive that would be. So I'm still, I'm, I'm almost done getting the first four back four books back into uh, paper versions. Uh, you can get you can get them all now, but the first book, Neptune Crossing, isn't in the same quite the same format. So I'm trying to bring them all so they look like a set. Um, <clears throat> and then I brought the second book out, Crucible of Time, came out in September. Hmm. So um, this was the first time that I uh, had to uh, it, releasing the books wasn't releasing the books was one thing, getting the books in front of an audience is quite another. And that was a, that was a challenge. Still is a challenge. Mm -hmm. I think my, my best friend in that has been BookBub. If your uh, listeners are familiar with BookBub, which promotes a, a discounted book every, every day. Um, <clears throat> back in January, I set the first book, Neptune Crossing, to free and ran a BookBub promotion. And that stimulated a lot of activity, people reading through the series and ultimately mm -hmm. buying the new books. So, um, that's been the most successful single thing I have done, nice. as well as talking to nice folks like you. <laughs> it's also been a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a good way to start the interview by making me blush. Uh, it, it does sound like a, it sounds like a hefty amount of work, like you say, to to bring all these books back into print, to work on all that, and obviously um, step into the world of uh, publishing the new titles and doing all that up front. It sounds like quite a lot of work, and obviously, um, as you mentioned there, you had some sort of. Uh, obstacles in the way as well and some some roadblocks to uh trying to get to where you were getting to go um yeah but there must be is there is there a part of you that 
I mean, how, how did you feel about that entire experience? Did it feel to you like, um, like you were sort of walking through mud or to you, was it a chance to uplift your old, old stuff and really sort of present it to a new audience? A little of both. Mm. Definitely a lot of walking in the mud. Uh, it's certainly great to, to find a new audience. Uh, the old books had a, had a pretty good audience, but that was, you know, many years had passed and in the publishing world, 11 years is a, a lifetime. So trying to bring the book to the attention of people who maybe had read the series and moved on and have forgotten about it was one thing and finding new readers altogether is, is another. So I've been, mm. it, it, that part has been exciting hearing from readers is saying, I just discovered your series. I'm loving it. Or, or I've been waiting. What took so long? But thank you. I'm really enjoying it. It was worth the wait. That sort of thing is uh, really gratifying. Mm. So and 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 makes you want to sit back down and get back to work. Yeah. So you're nearly at the point now where you can sit back and just go have five minutes where you go. It's done for now. No, actually, it's <laughs> not even close. I'm working on audiobooks of everything as well. Uh, of course. And I've. <clears throat> um, Neptune Crossing had been narrated by the amazing Stefan Rudnicki. I don't know if you are familiar with audiobooks at all. I'm not familiar, no. He has, <clears throat> I can't replicate his voice. He sounds like <laughs> God-gargling God boulders. Um, just an amazing reading voice. And he had done the first book uh, through a, a standard contract, um, a publisher contract. And uh, I decided to hire him to do the second, third, and fourth books at my expense and put them out and, and regard this as an investment in my retirement if I ever retire. <laughs> and so those are just coming online now and beginning to sell, but it's way too soon to see how successful that's going to be. And I'm hoping to uh, run a Kickstarter to raise money to do the new books in audio because that's, that hasn't happened yet. Interesting. So, Why are you looking at Kickstarter specifically? Um, because <laughs> I've blown through my budget already. <laughs> uh, I, I'm I'm not saying uh, Kickstarter as a specific platform, although that's been recommended to me. But, but crowdfunding, uh, the idea. Uh, yeah, crowdfunding. Mm. That'll be interesting if you if you do go ahead with that. I'll definitely have to uh, get you back on to see how that experience went. Um, yeah. crowd, crowdfunding is a. I mean, I tried to crowdfund a. It was a audio serial podcast last year. Um, and I've got a second podcast to this, which is a fiction podcast, which does pretty well. And it's, uh, and, and a big part of me expected a lot of the people to transfer over into this other audio podcast, but it's, it's really anyone's game. It just completely depends on what the project is and what, what hype it gets. But I'd love to, I'd love to hear what really? the experience of that well, would be. How successful was yours? Were you able it, to get we got, your... we got 80, about 80% funded, but it was Kickstarter. So if you don't get a hundred percent funding, you don't get anything. You don't get anything. Um, yeah. Whereas... If I'd gone for somewhere like Indiegogo, uh, I would have had at least some kind of amount right. that I could have put towards it. But um, not to assuage you from from taking that route, I think it's been successful well, it, for a lot of people. It, it's kind of a roulette game because mm. if you go one platform, you don't get as much of a percentage. Mm. Um, so I don't. I'm I'm not in any way a source of wisdom on crowdsourcing right now. I'm I'm just Yet. learning. Yeah. Where do you get your uh, Where do you get your knowledge from? Because obviously, like you say, you've now you've taken on the the brunt of publishing a lot of these books yourself and going through all that process and looking at um, marketing and attacking that in 2020, 2019, 2020. How have you approached finding out the information that you need in order to get those books out to the people you're trying to reach? Um, mostly from other writers. I'm, I've been part of circles of writers who are all going through the same process. Um, I've been part of a, a cooperative called Bookview Cafe, um, which was very helpful. Um, it's undergoing changes as we speak, and I don't know what's going to happen with that in the future. Um, but but other writers who have been down the same path have been enormously helpful to me and generous with their knowledge, and I try to uh, help other writers in turn who are just struggling with it. I'm, I have been doing ebook formatting for a long time, so I can help people who are struggling with that. And People have different areas that they are familiar with. So my covers, for example, were done by a, another writer who happens to be really good with Photoshop, uh, Maya Catherine Bonhoff, who is a science fiction writer, often published in Analog, has done one or two Star Wars books, um, and she's designed great covers for me. Um, so there's a lot of giving and taking in this community of indie publishing and 
hybrid publishing. So I would call myself a hybrid publisher right now. I certainly have not closed the door to traditional publishing, but right now it's not what I'm doing. Now I've definitely found exactly the same. I can reflect a lot of that. Most of, again, most of the people I talk to, they talk a lot about how easy it is to reach out to people and how often people ask for advice. And there seems to be a good network of, of sharing. Um, is that something that, because I'm trying to work out a time frame of whether that's, this has always been the case or whether it's sort of more of a new thing. Is that something that you found in your experience of publishing over the years? I think I've always found other writers to be pretty generous with their knowledge. I think, right. It, it used to be knowledge of writing itself and knowledge of how to maneuver through the world of, of regular publishing or traditional publishing. Now that's shifted over. So there are all these new areas of knowledge that, that people need to share. And uh, it's kind of interesting. I was at the uh, Nebula Awards conference last May. And just in the last year or two, the uh, science fiction writers and fantasy writers of America, um, SFWA, uh, gives out the Nebula Award every spring. And they recently opened membership to indie writers that had traditionally, had previously just been traditionally published writers. Um, so I went to this conference and at least half the people there were indie writers. And I was really amazed at how much savvier most of the indie writers were about marketing that way than the people who had long careers in traditional publishing, but who are still finding their way through this new new landscape. So right now, traditional publishing, I think, is is good for the people who have done well, are still doing well, and are probably maybe doing even better. The people, uh, new writers, it, it, it's hard to say. Uh, breaking in through a traditional company like Tor might be the avenue to finding their audience. Other people have just gone straight to indie and done really well. I've had some some of my writing students have uh, kind of shot past me in sales on just indie publishing their books because they're it, it is in one sense a game of what you can learn about how to how to make this system work for you, but it's also a large measure of luck. Mm. No, and some people agree. have told me, yeah, I had a book that shot through the roof, and I have no idea why it did. <laughs> <laughs> I wish Just I did now. so I could re- reproduce it. Mm. I say it's so hard to replicate that 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 success, and the people that do it do very very well. Um, yeah, but it, it is difficult to do. And you you mentioned there as well um, a little while ago that these books that you're doing now you're putting through your own imprint, which is, if I believe it right, Starstream Publications. That's right. And mm. um, what what are your plans with? that at the minute are you containing that to your own books and using that as a funnel just to manage your own books or are you looking to sort of that's widen right. no, that into no that's just an imprint for my books i don't um it was suggested to me once well maybe i should start publishing other people's books and i go whoa whoa whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I i didn't set out to be a publisher here mm-hmm. um i don't think that would work for me uh, but so the biggest uh, hurdle i'm facing right now i think is finding time to write the next book because so much of my energy has gone into getting these books out to the audience. And, and the, as I said, it's a process that's continuing. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm working on the seventh and final book of the series, but uh, I'm not too far into it yet. And what does your writing process look like on a typical day? Oh, there is no typical day in <laughs> my life. I, <laughs> I don't know. I tend to be a, a late night writer. Um, which I don't think is too unusual for writers. Um, but it, between various um, family issues, the aging parent and, and um, my brother passed away last year and various things have, have kind of made it hard to, ma- to maintain a regular writing rhythm. So uh, I'm not going to offer any clear picture or wisdom about that because I think people would just shake their heads and go, how'd this guy ever get a book published? Um, I have tried over the years to write shorter because one of, one of the things is that I tend to write long, complicated stories with a lot of characters, a lot of plot threads. And that is uh, from a point of view as a, a reader, I enjoy that sort of book. Um, and I enjoy completing that sort of book, but it does take a lot longer and it doesn't necessarily 
uh, pay the bills any better than writing short, snappy books that come out frequently. So I have tried to restructure my my creative process to pare it down a little bit and 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 make the books shorter and faster reads. You can see how well that worked out. My the first the Chaos Chronicles was actually conceived as a way to do that. I said okay. I've written some really long, really complicated books that left me exhausted when I was finished writing them. How can I do that differently? I know I'll write short, snappy books that make a long, complicated story all together. And to me, in the early 1990s, this was a revelation. This was an epiphany. This was before every TV series had story arcs that ran. Oh, so there's nothing new about this to the current uh, audience. And probably even then, people would have shaking their heads and going, well, duh, <laughs> you're not the first person to think of that. But to me, it was a new idea. And I set out to do it. And the first book was fairly short. And I wrote it fairly quickly. And the second book, a little longer, a little slower. And it, they have gotten progressively longer. And so as you can see, the, the what was to be the fifth book in the series and ended at, I think it was 260 some thousand words. Wow. Um, <sighs> did not fulfill my original vision of short, quick, snappy books. I'm starting to accept that maybe that's just the way it is in, in my creative head. Do you think there's a, what, what contributing factors do you think there are to you writing these longer, complicated books as opposed to what you wanted to set out to write originally? I don't know. I don't understand my own creative process, to be honest. Um, an editor I work with through many books said to me once, he said, you are the most intuitive writer I have ever worked with. You never know what you're doing until you've done it. <laughs> and then you look back and you say, oh, of course, that's what I was doing. And that was absolutely true. Mm. I try to plan these things out. And, I, and it's not like I do no planning. I do a fair amount of building of little bits and pieces of what I think will be important. But but fundamentally, in most of my books, I plunge in and I kind of know where I'm going, but I don't know the exact route I'm going to take. I take a lot of long turns and dead ends, and I'm discovering a lot of information at the same time my characters are discovering it. There was a, <clears throat> well, in the reefs of time and crucible of time, there was a, a, an animal who came along on this spaceship called a go cat. It was a to in a fraction dimensional creature that was um, brought along as a pet by the um, to in a fraction dimensional uh, leader, although they're not of the same species or even the same <laughs> dimensionality, but never mind that. Um, I brought this, this animal character in because I thought it would add a little color and because I thought the ship should have a pet on it. I had no idea how important uh, this. Bria the Goquette would become in the story and in the end plays an extremely significant role uh, toward the end of the book. Mm. Um, and that's just an example of, of how I do things not knowing why I'm doing them, but I figure it, it will work out. And mostly so far it has. That's definitely the magic of writing for me. I'm, I'm very, yeah. very similar to you in that the more I try to plan my process, the more restricted I feel and I, yes. I end up, yes. I, I definitely know what I want to achieve and I'll, I'll in my head have this sort of, I guess, very thin path through the grass of where I want to go. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think for me personally, and I'm guessing as from what you mentioned as well, in your case, discovering as your characters discover is, for me, it feels like the most natural way to write a story because it feels like the most authentic thing that you can give the character in that moment as opposed to trying to wedge all these pre-planned notions right. that might not fit because you're in the adventure together with them mm. um and i so there was one book i did try to outline and really follow the outline and it just led to all sorts of problems of, because it diverged from the outline and i kept feeling <laughs> well i should bring it back and it created tensions that were I, I was happy with the book in the end but it felt like a less organic uh, creative process to me i think mm. um i bet they're excellent writers who do it that way who know every every action that's going to happen before they set out to actually write the prose and more power to them um everybody's different 
Mm. How did you keep the string of the story between book four and book five with the the gap that you had? Because I, I find that I struggle at the minute because I'm, I'm only writing book three of a current series that I'm working on. And it's been about a year and a half, two years since I last touched the old one. Um, yeah. And I'm finding that I'm being very, very conscious of having to obviously bring the narrative through and make sure it's all genuine and linked together. How did you handle bridging that gap? With great difficulty. Mm. I, I reread uh, the first four books, I think maybe twice over the course of writing this, just to remind myself of things that had happened. And I didn't do it perfectly. And I had notes, of course, that I kept, and I'd refer back to the text from time to time. But... I would always find myself going, what the heck happened? Did I introduce this before? Uh, in, I, I didn't really set out to reread the fourth book after I had done this, but because I was uh, reviewing the audiobooks that had just been recorded, I did it that way. And there were a few places where I thought, oh, I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish I'd remembered that when I wrote the new one. So I'll leave it to the reader to find places where my continuity maybe wobbled just a hair. I probably could have used a couple of fans to to act as continuity directors mm -hmm. for me. Uh, but it's it's hard when you have a long story with a lot of detail and a lot of background and things happening. Mm. Uh, I did my best. I'm sure others do it differently and probably better. Um, yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel about your own prose when you go back and reread it? Well, you know, sometimes I'm really pleased by what I've written. Mm -hmm. And other times I go, oh, for God's sake, would you stop using that phrase? <laughs> or you said that 10 pages ago. You're repeating yourself. I, I really, you know, every writer should have a, I don't really mean this literally, but I feel as if, 10 years later, I want a chance to go through and clean it up mm -hmm. and, and just tighten it. And there's a little, every writer has verbal tics, things you repeat a lot and listening to someone else read the story to me really brought that <laughs> home. And I, so, so listening to even a terrific narrator read my work is both an exhilarating and an acutely painful experience because <laughs> I, I, I tend to listen to audiobooks while I'm walking my dogs and I'd be walking along and suddenly I wince. I, go, oh, I, want, to <laughs> I want to change that. Um, so there is, I don't know. I'm, I'm pleased with the work I've done and I'm uh, well aware that it's not perfect. Yeah. I always get in two minds about it because one side of me is thinking it would be great to fix it up. And obviously, between the time that you're looking at it now and the time it was originally written, you've obviously learned lessons, you know, you know more of what you'd want to put in it now. Um, but like that, I, I'm saying this because there's one book that I really want to tackle, but at the same time, because it was my first book, I love to keep it as it is, as a bit of a treasure trove to where you started. Yeah. But then yeah. you've also got audiences who are learning to discover you and they'll go back to your early works and then they'll see. I, well, yeah, I, I actually dealt with that same question when I was, uh, doing new audiobooks of books that have been out of print for years and years. Hmm. Uh, well, actually, this came up not with the audio, with the I'm sorry, not audiobooks, ebooks. Um, but where it came up with my first book, Seas of Ernath, was published by Laser Books, a short lived series from a Canadian publisher. Um, and then Dell Books did my next couple, Star Riggers Way and Panglor. Many years after that, Tor bought the reprint rights to Star Riggers Way in Pangalore and gave me a chance to re-edit or rewrite if I wanted to. And um, so the first one, I just did very light copy edit. And the second one, I thought, you know, I can write much better prose than I did. So I didn't rewrite it, but I just went through and heavily line edited it to, to take out awkward phrasing and just streamline and cut and make it clearer, I thought. And one of my readers said, I like the first version better. Why did you change it? <laughs> <laughs> but when I, but my very first book was out of print for, I don't know how many decades until I brought it out in my own ebook. And um, thanks to uh, a pirate whose name I don't know who had uh, scanned it in and put it up on a, a torrent site and somebody downloaded the PDF and sent it to me. And so that was my basis for it. And I decided I only, ch I fixed a few grammatical 
things, but I pretty much left it as is for exactly the reasons you cited. I, I want people to read the writer who was. It was a good, honest story, and it wasn't deep, but I found it entertaining. And I thought, oh, let people read the Carver who wrote this book in 1975 or whenever it was. Yeah. One thing I did come across when doing a lot of uh, research on yourself is that you seem to be blogging very, very regularly, which I'm quite interested in, um, and actually tracking down and going quite deep into your blog. You, it, correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. You've been writing or blogging since January t- 2005. Is that correct? If you say so. I have the slightest <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about blogging that that keeps you putting words on the page? Because it's compared to a lot of writers I've come across, it's pretty regularly maintained. Well, it's interesting you say that because I feel that I don't blog nearly as much as I ought to to maintain (laughs) presence. I get up on average, probably a post out once a week or maybe two a week. Uh, This week is an exception where I had a lot of things I wanted to write about that I kind of stored up and I wrote them all at once and scheduled them. Mm. Um, You know what got me into blogging in the first place was reading an article back, I guess it was 2005, about (laughs) how people were monetizing their blogs and earning a good steady income from ads on their blogs. And I thought, well, hell, I can do that. I think I earned a total of about $1.37 on (laughs) Google ads on my blog. (laughs) Um, But that got me started. And well, this was the period when there was a gap. in my book publication and um, I wanted to stay in touch with my audience and to some extent uh, uh, friends as well as audience whose names I don't know. So there be, I had regular blog readers and it was, it was um, nice to stay in touch with people that way. And then eventually Facebook came along and I'm not a big fan of Facebook. I really, my blog gets posted to Facebook and people respond there and I respond back and, and so it's useful, but I don't sit down and, and scan Facebook for uh, any length of time during the day. I just, it's not a platform I like very much and I don't have time for it anyway. So, uh, <laughs> but I recognize that that's how a lot of people uh, read what I write on the blog. I think far more people read my blog there than on the blog itself. Uh, so I try to mix it up with, with you know, things about uh, for example, today a uh, post went up about the new solar hot water panels that we just uh, had put on our garage roof. So I, I showered with water heated by the sun today. And nice. Great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to mix that up with things about the book and observations about quirky things. There was a came across this fascinating YouTube series called uh, the, His- the History Guy, I think. A 15 minute piece on how the Phillips head screwdriver came to dominate the market in the US, but not in Canada. And it was was like a totally obscure piece of trivia, and it was riveting. It was absolutely. (laughs) So if you look back at my blog, you'll find the link to that. And it's, um, it was just a fun story. So I come across oddball things like that, and I just want to share them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and from the writing point of view, sometimes just writing a writing a blog post is certainly easier than writing the next page of fiction, but it's not, it gets me warmed up and, mm-hmm. and if I'm feeling completely dry and I can write a blog post that kind of gets things flowing a little bit. At least that's well, my principle. That's my theory. Yeah. Were there ever times where you thought of giving up and if so, how did you continue going on after that? <sighs> many times, <laughs> many times. Ask my wife. <laughs> she'll, <laughs> she'll tell you how many times I come down from my office going, you know, I'm washed up. I, I'm never going to finish this book. I'm done as a writer. And she'll go there, there. You know, <laughs> felt this way before. The feeling will pass. You are still a good writer. And, and the, the new books, she hadn't read in process. She waited until I had a mostly like second of finished draft. And she read through and said, this is fantastic. I can't believe it took you so long to, well, no, she didn't say, I can't believe it took you so long. But, but um, I think she was a little, maybe a little nervous about reading it because what if it's not that good? But, mm. uh, I can't imagine that dynamic of, of what you'd have to say if you did read your partner's work and think, oh, this is crap. How, how, you, <laughs> how you'd even get past that point. But, sorry, go on. <laughs> there was a, a, 
<laughs> I was reading an interview of uh, uh, John Krasinski, the actor mm. and, and director director of, uh, of Quiet, Quiet Place. Place. Yeah. 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 Um, Cause he wrote the script of that. And he said he was on a flight with his wife, Emily Blunt, and she had not read it. And he handed it to her and said, do you want to read this? With this feeling of trepidation, because, you know, okay, we're stuck on an airplane together. If she reads it and doesn't like it, this is going to be a really awkward flight. And she read it and turned and said, you have to put me in this movie. You have to be in this movie. <laughs> and he breathed a sigh of relief and said, yes, I wrote it for you to be in the movie. But he hadn't told her that previously. Or, or This is how he told the story, and I believe it. Yeah. So has your wife been pretty instrumental in terms of keeping you going, in terms of encouraging? Oh, oh invaluable. I, mm. I, don't, I wouldn't have made it through without her help. And it, I, let's be honest, it doesn't hurt that she has a steady, well-paying job. Which <laughs> a writer needs a spouse who has a steady, well-paying job. Mm. Yeah. But no, she's been supportive from the very beginning. And, uh, and she loves science fiction and um, it's kind of funny because she's married to a science fiction writer, but she can never remember the names of the authors whose books she's read. So <laughs> turn to me and say, ah, I read this book. It was really fantastic. And a snake in it. Oh, you mean Vonda McIntyre's dream snake? Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> and <laughs> this has been part of our dynamic the entire time we've known each other. Mm. Nice. Um, my, I, uh, I found that with my, cause my ex partner uh, around the time when I actually started getting into writing, it was completely opposite dynamic. She wasn't discouraging, but she just uh-huh. wasn't interested. And I found that very interesting relationship to try and manage. Um, because there was always that part yeah. of you where you want to go, not uh, not in that desperate way, sort of support me more. But at the same time, it's like take some kind of interest. But at the same time, you can't force someone to have that interest. So I always find it interesting to hear how other couples riff and, and get through that kind of stuff. Yeah, I have a, a writer friend whose wife um, is very supportive of him personally and will read his stuff, but would never read another piece of science fiction willingly because she just doesn't not having does not get it. <laughs> get it. I, I, <laughs> I mentioned something to him at one point, I think, you know, feel free to share this with, um, with your wife if you want. And he said, <laughs> She wouldn't read it. She loves you. She wouldn't read it at the point of a gun. <laughs> she only reads my stuff because she's married to me. <laughs> He's got that advantage. Uh, I read as well <laughs> yeah. that you've got uh, you've got free online courses, um, and one of the big fundamental oh, yeah. parts of keeping it free is that you are much more interested in sort of just imparting the wisdom and helping others rather than gaining anything in in return. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about what that course is, maybe where people can access it, and what brought it into being? Yeah, the course is at writesf.com, very easy to find. Um, I, it's going to look a little out of, uh, outdated in terms of the, the screen, you know, what it looks like on screen because I put it together 10 or 15 years ago and, and have not updated it as much as I would like. But it grew out of a TV series I did back in... 1995, really, if my notes are correct. <laughs> God, I feel like I'm on Actors Studio. I don't, <laughs> I'm just showing I don't remember, off now. I don't remember these details. <laughs> um, I did two, uh, two, seasons, two seasons of a, a show for middle school students. It was a public, not, not PBS, but a publicly funded um, pr- production, well, uh, a studio that had connections with middle school classrooms all around the country. And back then it was all satellite link. There was no internet to speak of. And so there was no streaming. So this was all satellite feed and uh, they would be watching you live. Middle school kids would be gathered around the TV in their room. And some of the classrooms would have a phone connection back to the studio. So we'd have a sort of a question and answer time during the, during the show. And so it was just a fun way to connect with kids who were, I mean, they loved this kind of stuff. And I would uh, get excerpts of their stuff to read and, and talk about online. And I'd have uh, guest authors. And it was a lot of fun. And then it ended. And a few years later, I was approached to take the, the kind of the writing craft content of that and put it into a, 
uh, CD-ROM format. Uh, there's a program called, um, geez, what's it called? Math, the company was MathWorks. I don't remember the name of the, it, this was one component of a science-based uh, CD-ROM instructional thing. Remember CD-ROM instructional back in the stone ages was a way <laughs> of using computers to promote learning. Uh, so I, I took the content and wrote it up as a series of, of episodes in that. And then when that stopped selling, they released the rights to me and I just put it up on the web. And um, so it's free for anybody to look at. It was, it was written and geared to uh, younger aspiring writers. But the feedback I have gotten indicates that plenty of adult writers have looked at it and really found it useful, especially people. It doesn't have a lot of, you know, nuanced discussion of developing your plot and, and characters. It has basic, it, it takes you back to the fundamentals. And a lot of people getting started in writing, even if they're starting at age 60, uh, that's what they need to know about. And uh, I've heard from many number of people that it was really helpful to them in kind of framing how they went about writing. I don't know if anybody went on to become uh, quote successful unquote, because I don't even know what successful means. If they enjoyed <laughs> what they were doing and got satisfaction from it, that's successful um, from, you know, in that context. And what was the step that took you from obviously writing your own books into proposing this TV show, looking at doing the online courses. And, and the reason I ask is because uh, I'm about to embark on my first nonfiction project. And obviously Part of that, you have to come to terms with the fact that you're um, claiming yourself an expert of sorts within a particular yeah. field. So what did that moment, that transition look like for you? I think I proposed the show and I, I was made aware of the, the series of shows and, and someone said, you know, you could do a show on science fiction. They probably really like that. So I put something together, um, not necessarily expecting it would be picked up on. But, but they approached me and said, yeah, we'd like to do this. Um, <laughs> I've forgotten what your question was now. That's how I got started. Mm. Um, so what was that moment like did, from being a writer to thinking, yeah, let's, let's teach? Oh, uh, teach. Um, <clears throat> it was not something I ever planned to do. Um, at the same time, I was occasionally contacted by a, a writing workshop of one sort or another to come and, and speak on science fiction. So I'd done some of that. And I also, I don't really recall um, the timing of this. I was invited to be a, a guest instructor at the New England Young Writers Conference, which is held annually at the uh, famous Breadloaf campus of Middlebury College in Vermont, which is, is known for, it's, it's where Robert Frost was, his birthplace is nearby and um, famous poets, you know, uh, hold forth there, but they have a young writers conference at the start of the season. And I taught there a number of times. And so a lot of this stuff kind of came to me rather than my seeking it out. And, um, don't remember what year this was, but, um, my, my friend, uh, Joe Haldeman was, had been a long time teacher at MIT every fall. He would, uh, he and his wife would come to town and he would teach a science fiction writing course to un MIT undergraduates. And one year he was hospitalized and he had only just started the semester and it uh, looked like he wouldn't be able to finish it. So uh, he and his wife put my name forward to them and I wound up teaching the course at MIT for the semester, which was um, a different challenge, really bright kids. Um, some of them were really remarkably talented as writers. Some of them really struggled. Um, but when I, when I teach, I wasn't, because even though I didn't set out to teach, I find it really rewarding because I learn as much from the students as they learn from me, as how it seems. Hmm. And the questions they ask and seeing how they view things differently from what I'm trying to convey to them. And so it, it's, it's always an eye-opening experience um, and energizing. And what would, you say to, what would you say to someone who is maybe listening to this, hasn't yet put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard and is thinking of embarking on their first foray into writing, whether that's science fiction, whatever genre, 
what would your advice be to someone starting out today? Sit down and start writing. If you want some uh, guidance, look up my course, writesf.com for free. Uh, it'll just give you some ideas, maybe some little exercises to start with. But the main thing is to sit down and do it. Mm-hmm. And, and don't be afraid. Um, there are some really good books on writing. I love Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird, which talks a lot about how to write when you're feeling discouraged about writing and taking things one step at a time. And Stephen King's book on writing is very good as well. Um, but the main thing is don't spend years preparing to start to write. Just write. If you can type, you can write. If you can hold the pencil and read your own handwriting, you can write. And don't be concerned at first about whether it's any good. Be concerned about whether you have a story to tell. Tell it the best way you can. And rewriting was invented for making it good. I would not want any of my readers to read my first drafts. (laughs) (laughs) They're they're not always good at all. Hmm. Although my writing group does read them. (laughs) Fair. And so you got a writing group as well? I do. I've been part of the same writing group for over 40 years now. Interesting. um, uh, it's gotten pretty small right now. Craig Shaw Gardner is a member and Richard Bowker both have written science fiction, fantasy, mainstream. Craig has written horror and movie novelizations and he was president of the Horror Writers of America for a while. So um, we meet periodically and critique and bitch about getting old and, <laughs> and uh, drink beer. and and But they've been enormously helpful and and other people who were part of the group over the years enormously helpful to me in finding um flaws or making suggestions about how to improve chapters passages overall plot uh long before anybody else sees it so my books would not be um as good as they are without the help of this writing group that's why if, if if to newer writers, if you have a chance to get into a writing group that feels comfortable to you, take advantage of it. Now, it's important that it feel comfortable to you because a yeah. writing group that feels judgmental or where you have people who are trying to show off how good they are, eh, that's maybe less, um, the negatives might outweigh the positives. So, you know, that's important too. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. It was part of the reason because I, the, how I got into writing again was, um through a writing group and i definitely yeah i definitely jumped out when things started to get a bit frictiony uh but i loved i loved what you said earlier about um just writing just getting your butt in the chair and writing and i find it fascinating how so many people particularly successful authors that is their number one advice that they give and i've got a facebook group for great writers share uh link in the show notes for anyone who wants to jump over um in which whenever someone new adds themselves in they give their top tip for writing and how they get stuff done and nine times out of ten the advice is literally just to write but mm-hmm. at the same time that can be the hardest thing for anyone to do particularly if you've not just got yourself down there's so many excuses i've got so many friends who are interested in writing have said they want to write and just don't and i just i, I don't know what that switch is sometimes just to get people make, making it happen yeah. Um, well, another piece of writing of advice I have heard about how to advise aspiring writers is to say, "Don't write. Don't try to succeed, because you'll you'll only wind up miserable." So only the people who really want to write will try to do it. Mm. Now, uh, if you're talking about writing professionally, that might not be a bad piece of advice. Um, I'm not sure, but. But writing isn't just for professionals either. Everybody should have a chance to enjoy writing if it's something they feel like doing. And so to me, it's important to, to say that, hey, writing is, writing is a, well, it's an art, but it's also a form of self-entertainment. And maybe you'll just write fan fiction and maybe that's what you want. And maybe that's what you'll get pleasure from. So do it. God's sake. And there are professional mm-hmm. writers who write fan fiction on the side just because they enjoy doing it. And I haven't done it myself, but but other people say, oh, I just kind of like to do that. Mm. And why not? Why not? Yeah. You know, writing is a great equalizer. Yeah, I can definitely tell the days when I haven't been writing 
or if I've not done it for a few days in a row, I can definitely tell uh, a change in my mood. You mentioned earlier, um, you said that you're not sure what success is. If you had to define success for you, how does that hmm. look? You know, the subject came up on a panel at a convention recently. And when you've been doing it professionally, it's really easy to start to think success is measured by the number of copies you sell, the awards you might have gotten, how well you're known in the field. And that can be a really depressing measure if, if you're not part of the 1% that's really doing well. And I thought, well, what's, and it's not that I don't want those things, but when I think of what success means to me, it's, well, it's, it's hearing from a reader that my book really moved them or that they couldn't wait to read the next or that uh, they rank me with uh, Asimov and Heinlein in their minds. And, um, you know, I was at a, a signing last spring and someone came up and said, I don't know why they haven't named you Nebula Grandmaster. And I'm like, whoa, nobody's <laughs> ever said that to me. Uh, <laughs> but that kind of thing where people really let you know that you've touched them in some very meaningful way. That's success. Mm. That, that's the truest measure of success, I think, as a writer. And, you know, we all want the, the, the fame and the money and, and all that too. But that's, but touching people is the most important thing. Mm. I think that's a beautiful place to wrap up my questions before we jump into what is going to be the quick fire round. So I now have 10 okay. questions I'm going to throw oh, over yeah. to you as quickly as possible. Um, try and answer them as quickly as possible, but obviously feel free to pass at any point. This is all just for fun. Has okay. your heart rate elevated? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. It's literally all just for fun. So, uh, okay. are you, are you ready to go? Yeah. I feel like I'm on wait, wait, don't tell me. Okay. Uh, who is your favorite author? Tolkien. Nice. Same. Uh, sailing or hiking? <laughs> yeah. Sailing or hiking? Yeah. Sailing. On a scale of one to 10, how good of a cook are you? Seven. What's your favorite season? Fall. Who was the last writer to make you laugh? Just read somebody who made me laugh. I'll come back to that if I think of it. Yep. Uh, how okay. many pairs of shoes do you own? <laughs> uh, I don't know, five or six. What pets, if any, do you have? I have two dogs and I had a cat who we lost at age 21 recently. Oh, uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Trek. Would you rather live in a satellite out in space or in an underwater cabin miles below sea level? Mars? Um, wait, I'm sorry. Underwater cavern. Did you say on Mars or? Uh, uh, just an uh, underwater um, cabin miles below sea level. Oh, miles below sea level. Yeah. My God. I've written several undersea books and I'm fascinated with the undersea, but I'd probably pick the satellite habitat if I had to stay there. Yeah. Uh, do you have any party tricks? Blending into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And that's 10 questions. One bonus question is where can my oh. listeners find out everything about you and all that you're working on? Starrigger.net. And if you can't spell that, just Google my name. And I'll add that in the show notes as well. And uh, okay. one last chance. Did you have uh, anyone who was the last writer to make you laugh? Oh, my God. Dave Barry makes me laugh all the time. So I'll just say Dave Barry, although I know... Uh, uh, <laughs> I wish I could remember, you know... I love to laugh. So, mm. um, any chance? Dave if you Barry, yeah. if you do remember, email them over. I'll add them to the show notes. And then our <laughs> okay. Listeners can get them. Um, <laughs> okay. But Jeffrey A. Carver, I just want to say thank you very much for coming on the show. I'm, I'm glad we have this chance to talk. Well, it's been a real pleasure. I enjoyed meeting you. Perfect. And thank so. you everyone for listening. And I'm going to see you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Great Writers Share Podcast. Next week, I'll be joined by best-selling sci-fi author, Jonathan Yanez. Don't forget you can get early access to every episode of the Great Writer Share podcast and the chance to ask upcoming guests any of your questions just by becoming a patron of the show. All you need to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash greatwritersshare and support the show for as little as $1 a month. One more time, that's www.patreon.com 
patreon.com forward slash great writers share. Until next time.